All right, if you can turn to page uh, two. Okay, guys, uh, page two. Uh, example five. No, example four. Okay, uh, example four uh, is also Pythagorean theorem, uh, but um, initially the setup doesn't quite look like just one triangle, but we're going to try to make an adjustment so that it's only dealing with one triangle, and we're going to go through Pythagorean theorem. So uh, example four, this is on page two. Okay, Joe is standing six miles uh, east of Mo. So let me just north, south, east, west. So we have Joe standing six miles uh, east of Mo. So, so Joe is going to be to the right of Mo. Joe walks straight north at three miles per hour. And then Mo is walking south at one mile per hour. Okay. At what rate is this between them changing after two hours? This is kind of tough to do because then we're dealing with potentially two right triangles, and it's hard to uh, get that to, um, you know, we're going to have a much easier time if we can get this down to one triangle. So we're going to make some adjustment here. Let's just think about the, uh, the, the, ch the change in distance that is occurring between them. So if Mo and, and Joe are at the same level, and uh, horizontally away from each other, but one's walking three miles per hour, one's walking one mile per hour south. How far apart will they be after one hour? Four, right? Not two, right? It's three plus one, not three minus one. Okay, so after two hours, they'll, they're going to be what? Eight miles apart, right? So what if we make an adjustment where um, instead of um, Mo and Joe both walking. What if we just have Joe uh, absorbing the movement that Mo was making? And that way we can just force this into one triangle. So we can just let Joe absorb that one mile per hour and just let him go four miles per hour. Right? Still the same idea here. After four, after one hour, they're still going to be um, vertically uh, four miles apart from each other. But it just allows us to, to create our triangle, our right triangle, a lot more efficiently. Okay, so we're going to make that adjustment. Um, here's my X, here's my Y, and here's my Z. So Joe was here, but then Joe's going to end up here. All right, so uh, let's go through Pythagorean theorem. You know, that's going to be uh, the relationship between uh, the distances um, that is between them. A right triangle. We know we have to involve Pythagorean theorem. We can go ahead and do that. So every variable gets impacted by power rule. Every variable gets impacted by time. So x squared becomes what? 2x dx dt. Yep. And we apply that same process for each of these variables here. OK, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, identify each of these variables. OK, let me draw the diagram again here. Uh, 
So Joe is walking north three miles per hour while Mo is walking straight south one mile per hour, but we've merged them together where we're just going to let Mo stand still and let Joe do all the, um, the, the change. OK, at what rate is this is between them changing after two hours? So let's create a diagram what this diagram could look like in two hours time. So we have Mo here. Horizontal distance is still six. And then Joe is now going to be some distance away here. So after two hours, how far will Joe be from the starting point? Eight miles. Eight, eight miles. OK, so this is a moment in time, right? Got a right triangle here. OK, so we can treat this horizontal as the X. The vertical as the Y and the hypotenuse as our Z. And um, we can start filling this in, right? This is moment in time here, so X is equal to six. Y is equal to eight moment in time. Now, how can I find Z? Okay, put that in here. This is also uh, a um, ver uh, variation of the three, four, five triangle. So we know we can go to Pythagorean theorem or recognize this as just going to be 10. OK, dx dt is going to be the rate of change of this x. Is this 6 ever going to change? No. So our dx dt will be what? Yeah. Zero. Okay. It doesn't change. At the beginning is 6. At the end of the problem is still 6. OK, dy dt, we adjusted it. We want dy dt to be what? Four, right? That's the rate of change. We're just going to make Joe be the one that that moves. Uh, right, so four miles per hour. And we're looking for what? DCDT. It says, what is the rate of the distance between them? Okay, so the distance between them is this length MJ, and we want to find that rate of change. So we're going to find DXDT, sorry, DZDT. Right, so now it's just a matter of entering all this in, right? We have every variable accounted for. And we can solve for DZDT. Replace x with 6, replace dx dt with 0. 2y dy dt. And 2z dz dt. Anything times zero is just zero, so that goes away. We get 64 is equal to 20 dzdt. Okay, what do you expect out of dzdt? Positive or negative? Positive. Positive, right? We know that as Joe is walking away, we know that hypotenuse is going to keep continue growing, right? It may be a 10 right now, but um, leading up to that point, it's it's increasing all the way through. Okay, so. Uh, divide both sides by 20. We are getting a positive rate, so that confirms what we knew. Okay, reduce, use your calculator. That's 16 over 5. Then what's our unit going to be here? Z is in terms of miles. P is in terms of hour so miles per hour okay any questions okay so uh today we're going to focus on cones uh, cones uh, tend to be algebraically like the messiest problems, I think, for uh, what we're doing with related rates. Um, the calculus is not hard. It's just the algebraic part that the substitutions and the setup takes a, takes a little bit of time. So we'll go through this slowly. Uh, we'll, uh, after we get done with this, we'll do another cone problem. And then um, hopefully after two, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable. and We'll definitely get in more practice uh, tomorrow. OK, so let's read this problem here. It says a, a conical tank vertex down is 10 feet across. And uh, 12 feet deep, so 10 feet across. Go ahead and label that. And 
हैं सौ की थी Okay. Water is flowing into the tank at a rate of 10 cubic feet per minute. Find the rate of change of the depth of water when the water is 8 feet deep. So we have a volume of a cone, and the volume formula for the cone is pi over 3 r squared h. Now, there's actually two cones in this problem. Okay? And the reason why is because there's going to be water in this tank. And the water in this tank uh, is going to be formed by the shape that it's in. So if that the water level is also going to create the shape of a cone. So we got a cone within a cone, and that's going to be helpful with what we want to do. Okay. Now we're going to uh, do a cross section. So we're just going to look at this part of the cone. So we're going to just look at a two dimensional cross section. It's just going to be a, a triangle within a triangle. I'm going to step to the side here. Just show that part of the diagram. Now here's the big picture. The big picture is that we do want to find the derivative. We do want to solve for whichever variable that we want to solve for. But here, the issue is that we have too many variables. Okay? Um, we want to get it down to two variables. We want V, but is the issue is that both R and H are moving parts. So we want to, we don't have enough information to keep both variables. We want to get it down to one variable. Okay. So this is how we're going to do it. We're going to apply this idea of similar triangles. We know that we have a triangle within a triangle. The outer, the larger triangle is the dimension. That's not changing. What is changing is uh, the inside triangle, right? The smaller triangle, as water is getting poured in, that radius is changing. As water is being poured in, that height of that water level is also changing. So let's make some, uh, um, uh, some adjustments here. So we know that if we're just looking at the cross section, the radius of my uh, tank is just going to be what? It's five, okay. My dimension is 12. Okay. But because the water level, the water level uh, um, radius is changing for the triangle, um, the cone, inside cone is changing. We have to leave this as R. And the height is also changing for the water level. So we're going to call that H. Okay. So we're going to apply similar triangles here. And we're going to set up proportions. Okay. So we're going to say the radius of the small triangle, or radius of the small cone, is to the radius of the large cone as the height of the small cone is to the height of the large cone. We're setting up proportions. We're creating um, this relationship between radius and height. Okay. And the reason why is because we have too many variables and we want to get this variable down to or, or we want to replace one in terms of the other. Okay, this is how we're going to get there. All right, so before we move on, because right now we don't know, we don't know which one to replace, right? Do we want to replace R or do we want to replace H? OK, let's go back and read the problem here. I think we have a, a conical tank ten feet across, 12 feet down. We've got that. Okay, water is flowing into the tank at a rate of 10 cubic feet per minute. So let's look at this number here. Uh, water is flowing into the tank at a rate of 10 cubic feet per minute. What do you think that number is going to represent? What variable? Okay, it's volume, but there's a time component. So can you say, say it again? Okay, so it's cubic feet though. Cubic feet is, is volume, right? So there's the hint. The hint is that this cubic feet, that's a three-dimensional calculation, three-dimensional unit, has to be volume. And time. So volume and time, that's going to be dvdt. So we can just put this to the side here. dvdt equals. Now, do we want dvdt to be positive or negative? Every time we come across a rate, we got to make that decision because they're not going to tell us. Positive, positive because water is flowing into the tank. The water inside the tank is increasing. Okay, so 10 cubic feet per minute. 
Okay, find the rate of change of depth of water. So this is what we're looking for. Can you guess what variable that is referring to? Heights, okay. This is just heights? Good, right. We see the word rate, rate of change. So anytime you see that associated with any variable, you got to include time. So we know DHDT is the unknown. That's what we're looking for. Okay, when the water is eight feet deep. That's just H, okay? So H equals eight. Now, put a box around this number here. This could be potentially, um, uh, so this is the cause of a lot of issues when students are working through this problem. And here's the reason why, is that we're gonna be tempted to wanna use this a little too early because if H is eight, why not go ahead and start inserting it in? But this eight is gonna is only used after at the end of the problem. Okay, so you gotta keep reminding yourself if they give you an H value, okay, do not use until the end of the problem. Okay. If we insert this value too soon, we are losing the ability for us to hold on to that variable and we can't make much progress um, if that uh, if that aid is used too soon. Okay, so we are going to use it, but not at the beginning. So beginning is too early. All right, so let's go ahead and cross multiply, okay, because eventually we're going to have to solve for one of these variables. Just go ahead and set that up. So here's what we want to do. We want to replace one of the variables, okay, because we want to get our equation either in terms of R or in terms of H. Uh, but the question is, how do we know which one to target? Okay, and here's the hint. The hint is we look at what's given to us. Okay, if the information that we're trying to find is DHTT, and if the variable that that we have is is H, then it kind of makes sense for us to have our equation in terms of H. Okay. Now, if we do everything in terms of R, we can still get to the answer, but we see that it's going to be a lot more efficient, a little faster if we just kind of fall in line with, with what's given to us, right? If what's given to us in terms of H, then it'll be easier for H just to produce DHDT, right? So that means we want to find a way to replace R. So we go to our equation and we, we want to solve for R because we want to find a way to replace R. Okay, so we solve for R. We can now divide both sides by 12. So R is equal to 5H over 12. Okay. Now, all this is still algebra. We haven't done any calculus yet. We're not ready for it yet until we get our equation nicely cleaned up. So right now there's too many variables. We want to find a way to substitute one of the variables away. Okay, so we're going to rewrite the equation with that R replaced in terms of H. Okay, so let's try that. V equals pi over three. Okay, what comes next? Yeah, five H over 12. What do I do with that five H over 12? Yeah, don't forget about that exponent squared. And then there's also another H, right? Okay. So we're making progress because we're able to find a way to cleanly replace R, right? We're not just randomly choosing any value to replace for R. We have a very specific way of equating R and H using similar triangles. Okay. So we are still in the cleanup stage, okay? We're, we are going to find the derivative. The derivative should be the easiest part of this problem, especially if we spend the time to get everything cleaned up. Okay. So we're not ready for calculus. We could, but then we got to go through product and chain, and there's no need to do that when, when it's much easier to just get that cleaned up. So don't do your calculus step. Don't do power rule until all your parentheses and all your exponents are nicely cleaned up. Okay, so let's go through and clean this up here. So pi over three is going to be here. Okay, uh, what can I do to get rid of the parentheses? Yeah, 
distribute the exponent through it, right? There's no plus or minus in, in here, so I can just cleanly distribute that exponent through. So the five becomes what? 25, H becomes H squared, and the 12 becomes 144, and then there's still an H here. I got rid of my parentheses, but there's still more things I can clean up. Okay, I want to get all the numbers together. I want to get all the variables cleaned up together. So you can use our calculator if you want. Okay, now if you use your calculator, leave pi out of your calculator um, because we want to hold on to our exact value. Kind of treat pi as a variable. If you insert pi into the calculator, it'll start giving you um, messy decimals. We want to try to leave our answer as clean as we can. So we're going to put all the numbers together because I can rearrange them. So 25 pi is in the numerator. And then I can merge the 3 and 144 together, multiply those two numbers, and I get 432. And then what's what's h squared times h? h cubed. Now we have 25 pi and h cubed in the numerator. We have 432 in the denominator. We are ready to find the derivative, but I'm going to suggest that we put this in a different form. You don't have to, but I think students tend to like to do power rule if they don't have to stare at a number below the variable. So how can I rewrite this so that I don't have to stare at that 432 below my h? Okay. Or how about this? What if I just made this 25 power 432 a number in front of h cubed? I don't even have to do that. I just, I'm still leaving 432 in the denominator. I'm still leaving 25 times in the numerator. But you see what I can do here? I can just push it out and just treat it like a number in front of HQ, right? Rather than as dividing by a number, it's like having a one third or a, a four, or it's just, it just, it's messy, but it's, it's still a number in front of HQ. And that kind of makes it a little cleaner because when you find the derivative, you just have to worry about the derivative for HQ. So this is where we want to be before our calculus starts. Okay. The hardest part is to get to this part, this point. Okay. So any questions up to this point? Okay. So again, to recap, what we've done so far is uh, we've created our diagram. We knew with cones, we got to deal with uh, two variables. Uh, we got to get it down to one variable. We use similar triangles to set up our proportions. We decide which one to replace based off of the information given to us. We have H's, a lot of H's given to us, so we would prefer to just remove R because it just makes it a little bit cleaner. Once you replace R in terms of H, then you're just trying to clean up, okay? You should be able to get to the point where you're staring at an, a relatively easy power rule problem. You shouldn't have to deal with product, quotient, or chain rule, okay? Should be nice and clean. So now that we're here, we can go ahead and find the derivative. So V becomes one, what? V dt, right? Remember, time is the, is the independent variable here. It'll have an impact with every uh, variable we come across. Okay. Does anything happen with this 25 power 432? It just stays, right? It's just the number hanging out in front of the variable. It doesn't go anywhere. H cubed becomes 3 H squared. Good. D H D T. So now we have our derivative. Everything is, is ready for us to start inserting into this equation. So let's see, let's see what we have. We have dv dt, right? That's 10. We have H. Eight. Okay, so now we can use H, right? Now we're at the end, and then we're looking for DHDT. Perfect, right? So everything that we need and we're looking for is ready for us to now uh, to plug in. Okay, so I'm going to start inserting my values in. DVDT is ten. H is eight. Now, 
ultimately, I want to divide all that messiness over to the left side and just get a number. But I'm just going to try to see if I can do some more cleanup, try to get this to be a nice clean fraction. Because if I can, then I can just divide that fraction over and dividing by a fraction is the same thing as multiply by the reciprocal. It just feels a little bit cleaner if I can just start getting these numbers a little bit more organized. So I'm going to take that 25, the 3, and the 64 and put it all together in the numerator with a pi next to it divided by 432. So 25 times 3 times 64 gives me 4,800. The pi stays. I want to move that fraction over. So dividing by that fraction is the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So the reciprocal is 432 divided by 4800 pi. So that's my DHDT. I'm going to see if I can do some more cleanup, leave the pi out of the calculator, and just see if you can multiply this out and let the calculator reduce it for you. Now, pay attention here. Where is pi located? In the denominator. So in your final answer, it's going to have to stay in the denominator. Don't just let it float up to the top because I know it feels more familiar. That pi feels out of place, but algebraically, if that's where it that's where it lands, then that's where it should be. Okay. Okay. So 432 divided by 4800. Enter that into the calculator. I got 0 0.09 9 over. Uh, oops. Hold on. 4,800. Okay, I got. Um, okay, times 10, sorry. So this gives me uh, 4,320 divided by 4,800. I get 9 over 10 pi. And that pi has to be in the denominator there. Okay. And what's our unit of measure here? Height is measured in terms of feet. Okay. And then time is minutes, so feet per minute. Okay. A lot of work to get to the point where the calculus can be applied. But once you get once you get to this point, the derivative feels a lot cleaner, and then we should get it down to all uh, the DHDT. Okay. Any questions with this process here? Okay. We're going to do another one of these problems just to kind of practice through these procedures, these steps. So if you guys can turn to page three, and we'll try number one at the top of the page. I think that should be enough room for you, but if you feel like you need additional room, uh, feel free to come up and, and grab a, um, a, a blank sheet. Okay, so go ahead and start on, on uh, the problem. I'll leave this here on the board so you kind of see all the steps. All the steps should line up pretty nicely. Um, we're just dealing with a different, different sets of numbers, but the setup should feel very similar. Okay, so see how far you can get. And I will go through all the steps with you. Um, after you guys had a chance to try it.
set of your proportions using similar triangles. Again, everything that is provided for us is in terms of H. And that kind of gives us a hint that, OK, it will be a little bit smoother um, process if I just force my volume equation to be just in terms of H. So I want to find a, a way to replace R. So I'm going to solve for R so that my equation ends up just in terms of H. So I can take advantage of these values that will eventually pop up through my derivative. And then once you make your substitution, then you got to spend some time cleaning this up, right? Do not think about the derivative until you get all that cleaned up. Your H's are merged together, your coefficients are merged together. So now we begin our cleanup process, right? We want to be able to square each of the values inside the parentheses. So the three becomes what? Nine, nine squared over 16. H becomes H squared. Okay, so we can start dropping the exponent out. And let's push all the, the, the fractional coefficients together, right? So the nine pi gets pushed together. 3 and 16 gets pushed together. Make sure that you also merge the H's, right? We don't want to leave the H's separate because there's no need to have to go through product rule. Why not just right, make it come together so that we can just rely on power rule just once, right? We don't want to do the derivative of two different variables if we can put them together. So this is my cleaned up equation before I start my derivative process. Now, I decided to go a little one step further because I saw another uh, factor between 9 and 48. I can take out another 3, but it's not wrong if you went into the calculus from this step because eventually the 9 and 48 was just cleaned up on its own. But, but for me, I'm just um, um, thinking that if I can clean up, the, the more I can clean up, uh, the smaller numbers I'll have to deal with. Okay, so this is my my equation right before my calculus starts. So if you're trying to find the derivative before these steps, then it's too early. Okay. I know it's tempting to look at that H, you know, this H and start you know starting, you know, putting your DHDG in place, but it's just not ready. This is where you want to be ideally right before you do your derivative process. So now it's nice and clean. V becomes what? V, V, D, T. What happens to the 3 pi over 16? Space. Okay. H cubed becomes 3 H squared. Don't forget D, H, D, T. Yep. So as soon as your D, V, D, T and D, H, D, T shows up, now you just start plugging in, right? You have D, V, D, T and you have H and you're looking for D, H, D, T. Now, um, you may be after this step, our steps may not align, which is fine. Sometimes uh, I may choose to combine things a little um, differently than how you're combining things. But ultimately, uh, if your end steps is correct, that's what's important. So we should be in lockstep up to this point. But as soon as we find the derivative, you may start to merge things differently, and that's OK. I decided to put the threes together and make it nine pi over 16, but you're more than welcome to start putting information in, right? As soon as DVDT and DHT shows up, you're more than welcome to start inserting values and you're ready to get to your answer. So DVDT is negative two, H is 30. Right? Careful with your exponents, take your time with them.
So again, you may have decided that you didn't put the threes together, which is fine. But Once I get to this step, I'm just trying to find a way to get this a little bit cleaned up before I divide it over to the other side. So 9 times 30 squared, 30 squared is 900, 900 times 9, 900 power per 16. Bring that over to the left side. And again, pi is going to end up in the denominator, so just be careful that your answer is going to, is going to have pi in the denominator after you force the reciprocal to show up. Notice that pi is in the denominator. It's just where it landed, and not always, it's not always pi is in the denominator, but if algebraically, if that's where it ends up, then we need to keep it there. Okay, let me walk around and just see how you guys do. If you have any questions. So again, let me just point out the, the, the main trouble spots that students experience with these problems. Um, the first is knowing uh, how to decide between R and H, right? How we know which variables to solve for um, or to replace. You look at what information you gather, right? If all your information is, is in terms of H, then naturally uh, H just makes more sense for your volume equation. If everything you gathered is in terms of R, then uh, getting your equation terms of R is going to make more sense. But either way, we're always going to set up our proportions. Okay. Um, the second thing is um, being tempted with that with that H value and wanting to use this value a little too soon. Uh, you're really just going to imagine like you don't have to see this until you get to the derivative. Okay. I know, and, and it's so um, troublesome because there's so many H's, and every time you see an H, you're going to be tempted to use that 30 because it just feels like such a natural place for it to go. Or when the volume equation shows up, students want to start replacing these with 30, but you just have to keep reminding yourself that, you know, even though it's one of the first numbers you see, you're just not, you're just going to kind of try to be, um, um, yeah, just try to understand that we just cannot, we're not ready for that number just yet, okay? And the reason why we don't want to use it too early is because if we use it too early, then we're telling this problem that the height of the water level is always at 30. Right? And this, that's, is that a true statement? Not right. Water is, is coming in. I mean, there's a moment in time when it's 30, but it's not going to stay 30 forever, right? Water is continually flowing into the, into the tank. And if you start the problem with 30, then you're, you're stating that it's a constant, which it is not. Okay. Um, the other trouble spot that I see, uh, students would get to this point, and then they would find the derivative. They get 2H dH dt. And then they try to do derivative twice with the H's, but you really just have to take the time to clean up. Okay, if you're doing product rule, quotient, chain, it's too, it's too much. Okay, that means, um, you know, with these cone problems, you should be staring at a relatively nice, clean power rule. Okay, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do power rule twice within the problem. And then, of course, um, the pi and the, deno and the and, uh, that denominator pi coming up to the top. That's another issue that that I see uh, that students experience. Okay, any questions? Uh, there's sometimes the problem may present itself in a way where you're, you're kind of a little bit confused as to what to do with R and H. 
Um, so we'll tackle some of that um, in the next few days, but um, but hopefully uh, we've seen this twice. We're kind of getting a handle of it, and we'll get some more practice tomorrow. Okay. All right, so we get your phone. So now that pie is going to be in yeah, and then once you're here, you can flip it. That should have a lot of you. Your setup looks right. <laughs> 